and the Zoom meeting will automatically be eligible to receive the CPD certificates. Those that are viewing this webinar on social media platforms, it will be subsequently uh, posted on the SADA website and questionnaires and members will be allowed, permitted to uh, uh, complete their questionnaires and then the CPD uh, questions. I'm just waiting for the participants to stabilize before we invite Professor Moi Polite to welcome members. Thank you very much. Uh, may I then call upon the president of the South African Dental Association, Professor Moi Polai, members. Thank you. Unmute yourself. Thank you, Mr. Gavin, and a warm welcome to all the participants in tonight's um, webinar on wellness and mentorship. I think what is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, and obvious to all of us is that um, mental wellness is really being heightened. And it's important that during this pandemic, if we haven't done so before, we need to take cognizance of our mental health wellness. And um, fortunately for the South African Dental Association and its our partners, it has become one of the key um, pillars on supporting the membership in order for them to have a productive and positive professional um, workspace. Without any further ado, I'll give it to, I'll give over to the chair of the wellness and mentorship um, work stream, Dr. Kusal. Thank you. Welcome everybody. I'm so glad that we're getting to spend an evening with you, a short bit. So um, the agenda is that we will have with us Dr. Hammond Vallab as our first presenter this evening. And Dr. Vallab has been um, in private practice as a general medical practitioner for since 1988, practicing in Johannesburg. He's also a member of the Central uh, Center for Diabetic, Diabetes uh, Excellence. He's got his master's in diabetes and he has a special focus on dietary management of chronic diseases and diabetes. After his presentation on the agenda, we'll have Dr. Vishal Bika from the Young Dentist Council who will take us through a, a nice practice on how to integrate mindfulness with dentistry. So we know that as Prof said, that our health really needs special care now to increase that immunity and to stay particularly robust and resilient. And Dr. Balab is gonna actually focus on just that the challenge is how to upgrade our health during these COVID times and further. Dr. Vanup. Welcome. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes? I'm on? Okay. So, uh, this one, share. Firstly, thank you very much um, for having invited me to come and share some of my thoughts and feelings about um, managing a situation that is so fluid and, and yet so apt in, in our long-term lifestyles. So I was taken aback, firstly, I must say, when uh, Reggie sent me a WhatsApp message and I thought it was for like next year. 
until Anita sent me a message to say that it's happening on Wednesday. And then between the two of them, they kept changing the topic. So they, and then I had to revisit some of the slides. But um, what you're going to see presented today is something that I have done for um, many years now. And uh, I think let's just get to the crux of this thing. You know, we have, um, how do I advance this thing? I'm trying to advance the slide. Oh, there we go. So <clears throat> we're going to go through a couple of things and uh, a lot of what we're gonna talk about is gonna involve the brain, the gut and the link between the two, the role of inflammation, the role of addiction, and then how disturbance in the health occurs, what really is immunity and why is it going bad, okay? So the brain itself has this blood brain barrier which stops stuff from getting into there and especially large molecules. So what we've noticed is that the brain in depressed people have a high amount of cytokines and cytokines are these little antibodies that are secreted by uh, white blood corpuscles. And what happens is that systemic cytokine levels can be affected also by the stimulation of the vagus nerve that goes back up into the brain. And what we found is that people who are depressed have a very strong history of eating lots of junk laden carbohydrate food. And I think that that is the core of what we see in chronic diseases today. So depressed people are also very often obese. They have a high amount of endogenous inflammation and they have this chronic stress. Depressed people are persistently down and it, it has a serious impact on the immunity through several mechanisms. We know that high cortisol levels Cortisol binds onto the white blood corpuscles and almost paralyzes them. And then there's this relationship between the microbiota in our gut and the vagus nerve. So initially we just thought there's a whole lot of bugs in our gut and they are there and we need to get rid of them. And so we took antibiotics like it was going out of fashion. And I think the trend is now coming through that, listen, these bacteria are there for a reason. We have at least about two to three kilograms of them in an adult human being. And our initial thinking of it just being on the surface is actually incorrect. They lie even inside the endothelial lining of the cell and they have this relationship. They talk to the cells, how you've been to their house, the weather out there, and they feed nutrients to the cells that the cells need. And they also take back messages says, listen, if you see so-and-so coming along, just send him through to me. So this is the symbiotic relationship that we see. But the, 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 the integrity of these bacteria is reliant on the nutrients that we send into the gut. The symbiosis between the gut, the bacteria, and the brain, or the brain neurotransmitters, is, is integrally related to the vagus nerve. So these bugs will go into the vagus nerve and says, listen, send the message to the brain. I'm not feeling good. And that's how this whole thing about gut feeling came about. What we know, and we, we, we've seen this uh, quite remarkably, is that high carbohydrate, highly refined carbohydrate, have a terrible effect on the, bi the gut biome. And that they affect also the amount of inflammation that is present. So inflammation typically is the redness that you'd see when, when a guy comes in with a dental abscess. But there are things that add to this inflammation. But, and the thing that is the biggest culprit amongst the food that we eat is the seed oils. So typically sunlight, sunflower seed, it's one of the most inflammatory things we ever put into our system. And the level of inflammation is determined by how much of omega-6 there is in the compound. So typically, um, fish oil is high in omega-3. And it's got maybe about 
a ratio of three parts of omega-3 to one part of omega-6. Sunflower oil has got one part of omega-3 to about 20 parts of omega-6. Very, very inflammatory. What we know is that depressed people, 60% of the time would choose refined carbohydrates. And they also get more depressed when they eat more carbohydrates. So the more carbs they eat, the more depressed they get, and the more down they feel, the more refined carbs they eat. So it's a vicious cycle. And that is what is happening. We have people that continuously, in fact, an average household would consume probably in the region of between 60 to 80% of their total caloric intake in the form of carbohydrates only. And of that, about 80% would be refined. So I'm talking about bread, rice, potatoes, milli meal, sugar, fruit, juice, cold drink. And this is where the source of the problem ar arises. Now the brain is, is primarily fat and it's composed of mainly omega-3, which is why people in the Nordic countries are actually brighter up there. The Japanese have found it out many years ago. And that there are many neurotransmitter channels inside the brain. And these neurotransmitter channels are lined with cholesterol. And the cholesterol lining, it is almost like an oil. It improves the way this thing functions. But the brain is well protected by this blood brain barrier and the cerebrospinal fluid around it. So to get into the brain needs a lot of things. But the, there's great disturbance that the brain is actually encounters. And the primary one is inflammation. And this inflammation comes from inflammation outside of the brain. So for instance, if you have a flu, you feel down. Now, what has the flu got to do with you feeling down? When you have a flu, your bodies release antibodies, and these antibodies are cytokines, which can pass the blood-brain barrier and induce this feeling of emotional unwellness, which is why you feel down. You don't want to do anything. And that's what happens in inflammation. And the more of that inflammation you have outside the brain, the more of it will affect inside the brain. And you'd also get disturbance of these cholesterol channels. Now for years, we've been told that cholesterol is bad for you. You're gonna die, you're gonna get a heart attack, you can get a stroke. And there's absolutely no, I'm saying no proof of that. We've been sold the biggest lie under the sun. And in fact, what they found is that people with the highest level of cholesterol live longer, are less demented, are better, and they're better at fighting infections. So now I sit and wonder, why are we being told this? And that is the point that I wanted to bring about is that we've been driven by companies that are manufacturing these products that are lowering cholesterol. That they're found in these blue zone areas people who are living up to over 100 years, their LDLs are sitting at four and the total cholesterol of seven. If you were in the middle of Santon, they'll stick you into the hospital and put you on a drip and just lower that down. But these people are doing exceptionally well. So when you disturb this cholesterol channel, you get mentally slow and you're tired, and you're physically weak, your, your comprehension is poor, you get diminished concentration, you forget things. And most of all, there's an early onset of dementia. Proven, people who have lower cholesterol are demented a lot sooner than, than those who have got normal cholesterol. So let's talk about immunity. Immunity is the ability of the body to fend off foreign intruders, like infections or aber aberrations in the body. And the ability of the body to remove abnormal tissue as well. So one of the things is like excessive sun rays causing melanoma and the body trying to attack that or from irradiation causing leukemia. And then there's a whole host of ingested agents like mercury and food and atheroma itself is, a, is, is an inflammatory response. So what are the defenses? Our defenses is what the skin is a barrier, our biome, which starts in the mouth, going all the way down to the lower end 
Then we also have it in our eyes, our nose, our skin. Then we have innate immunity. So innate immunity is those guys that are standing there in front with an assay guy and this is, listen, I don't know, you just get out. Then we have cell mediated immunity. This is when a pathogen will enter or a foreign subject or even an aberration in a cell where the cell says, you I don't recognize, get out. And then humoral immunity is where the cells manufacture antibodies to a particular agent, be it an infection or a cell, to, to, to peg that, to identify this is who he is. And then they call all the connections to say, listen, you better attack this guy. So the causes of the problems, you know, we put on cosmetic stuff and powders and antiperspirants and perfumes and contact lenses and jewelry. And all this stuff has a serious impact on our body. And then you guys have been scripting mouthwashes like for zillions of years and goggles. And especially eye drops and sprays and foods that are consumed. Then there's also ailments, physical ailments like the flus and the bronchitis. Then there are treatments of the ailments not forgetting the environment we, we work in, the environment we live in, our travel. Some of us travel for about an hour to two hours every day in traffic. And, and Johannesburg has got a very high rate of pollution. I never put the, 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 the vent in my car on because I don't want all that junk coming through my vent. But most important is the mind and the stress. So our mind is is a complex thing. And everybody thinks, well, the mind is somewhere there. The mind is actually everywhere. And the consciousness is linked so deeply into this. But the mind is supposed to be a slave. It's supposed to take in our input and get you to produce a response. The mind has now taken over. It says, I'm in control. And oh my God, look at this thing, it's turned that way. So it's going to fall off. And then it creates a permutation of events. So like, for instance, in COVID, oh my God, a person just sniffed at me. I think by the time I get home, I'd have probably received this, this whole bulk of infection into my system. And what happens is it creates the stress. And initially, your heart beats faster. And then you continue to stress about it by the time you get home. By then, your cortisol levels have gone up and cortisol binds to your white blood corpuscles and paralyzes them. Together with the cortisol rising, your sugar goes up and the sugar also impedes your immunity. So it's just one big complex set of circumstances that continue. Amongst the ailments is obviously the, the, the big three, bacterial, viral, and parasitic infections. But one of the things that is really, really driving problems these days is metabolic problems like blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, heart disease, asthma, dementia, arthritis, gout, yes, gout, um, attention deficit dis disorder, depression. We're managing to reverse all of these on diet. And then stress itself, we know that when you stress, you eat more, you eat more junk and you keep eating more junk and you keep going to the fridge and you keep looking for more things. And stress also causes sleep disorder. So you, you're sleeping less and the quality of your sleep is much poorer. A big part of your immunity is driven by melatonin and melatonin only goes up when you sleep. If you're not sleeping guys, you're going to be in big trouble, eating disorders, but just to go back on sleep. So you take a sleeping pill and you knock out. So it's like switching off your brain by the main switch. What you need is good, decent REM sleep. When you take a sleeping pill, not going to happen. Coming back to the presentation and eating disorders. So, you know, um, anorexia, bulimia, and then just pure gluttony. Now, I know I say this in a bad way, but there are people who can't stop eating. And the reason is simple. They're addicted to the food they eat. It's like, I often ask my patients, 
if I give you one block of chocolate, can you stop? And the answer is no. It's like going to an alcoholic and telling him, like, just have this one single shot, you'll be okay. He can't stop until that bottle is finished. So these eating disorders are real folks and they have a serious impact on people's lives. Then there's relationship disruption. I mean, you know, you go home, you're tired, your wife has been tired because she's been sitting here the whole day and she says something untoward and you just blurt out. And then the whole thing flares out of control and before you know it, there's this, this massive problem. And this adds to your existing problem. You're coming with this whole bag full of stuff, like all those PPEs that I bring home every day. And then when you come home and you do this, you just add to that, yeah? So this just drives up the cortisol level. It drives up all the other problems. And then now with, with COVID, and even if it wasn't COVID, there's always monetary problems. There's a physical manifestations of these things, headaches, blood pressure. And with all these things, you get additional problems like your diabetes getting worse, your tension headaches getting worse. And then guys, let's be real. I mean, you know, then that brown bottle really looks very interesting. And what happens is that the alcohol diminishes your ability to think. It takes away your ability to differentiate right from wrong. And yes, it dulls the senses a bit, but it's not doing you any good. And it's definitely not helping your immunity. If anything, it suppresses your immunity. So that occasional glass of red wine is not, is not criminal, but if you're hitting down half that bottle, no can do, okay? Chronic bowel disorder is a very, very common thing and we're not looking out for it, but there are many patients who are presenting with that. So how does ill health happen? So we have food that is processed to such an extent that it has to last on the shelf like for years. You know, the manufacturer makes it, it goes to uh, Koo, and then Koo puts it into a can and it's supposed to stay in Koo's warehouse for two years and then ShopRite buys it and goes to their warehouse for another three years. And then when they think that the price is right, then they take it out and they put it on a special, but they bought it at two cents and now they're selling it at 20 Rand. But in order for that to happen, it needs additives. It needs preservatives. And then it must look good. So they put colorants. And then it mustn't separate out, so they put anti-caking agents. And then just to make sure that the beans are separated from each other and it's all looking good, they put stabilizers. So all of these things collectively have an effect on the gut. So besides the processing, this packaging, this transportation, the storage, and there's enhancers. And then just to make you feel good, this is with added vitamin this. It's like saying, listen, you know what? You, we will keep the the, the roads untarred, but we'll give you a 20 rand discount on every pothole repair that you go for. <clears throat> so one of the most disastrous things that man has ever started putting into his system is wheat. Wheat as we know it today is extremely, extremely inflammatory. And I went back and I looked at this. When I first came across this, I thought, nah, can't be none. This was something that my forefathers grew up on. Yes, they did grow up on that, but it's not the wheat we're eating today. The wheat from that time was almost the size of, of, of a long grain rice. The wheat, the wheat from now is like a small pebble. And it is, it has been so heavily genetically modified that it can withstand some of the worst droughts and the, some of these caterpillars that can come away, it'll just spit them away. And that has been, why wheat is what it is. It is durable, it is strong, and you can harvest it for almost eight months in the year. So it has become a cash crop, which has become so uh, uh, beneficial financially that we now have created a whole industry of problems around just wheat. Added to that, we have preservatives like sulfur dioxide and tartrazine, you guys remember tartrazine? And then for those of you who ever look at the food, look at the E numbers. 
and there's tons of them. In most packaged food, you're gonna find at least two E numbers. So <clears throat> these three culprits form the backbone of some of the most disastrous things that ever happened to human beings. And when you throw wheat on top of that, and wheat is a very common byproduct and an additive to most packaged foods. So it is highly processed, it is very addictive, and the more of it you eat, the more of it you want to eat. So a typical example is you have a peanut butter and jam sandwich. And immediately within an hour, you'd want something else. So it'll be a scone. It, it'll, it will never be something protein, never be. It will always be a, another carbohydrate. And the reason for that is that the moment you've eaten this highly processed carbohydrate, within five minutes, your blood sugar will shoot up. Within seven minutes, your insulin will start rising to drop that glucose. And then within about 15 minutes, your sugar will come plummeting down. And at least 30 to, to, to 60 minutes later, you will be starving hungry again. And you keep going through that cycle the whole day. Then there's the very highly processed seed oils. You know, this triple refined cholesterol free sunflower seed, absolute rubbish. So why am I saying this? For those of you who are whiskey drinkers, I must tell you, this triple refined is exactly the same thing. They take the oil, which has got a slight gray tinge, then they heat it super hot, and it goes up into this chamber and it cools down. And then they do that again twice more until it comes out reasonably yellow colored on the other end. And then to get rid of those few discolorants, they throw hexane into there. No lie. Look it up, Google it. And the same goes, they take this oil and they put hydrogen gas into there and then they heat it again until it binds. And guess what it forms? Margarine. But that stuff is white. So they put a colorant in there to make it look like butter. Okay? Very, very inflammatory. Now remember, your cell wall Every fourth molecule is cholesterol. You don't take cholesterol and then you take a statin and it gets rid of your, your body's ability to make its own cholesterol. Now you're replacing cholesterol with all this polyunsaturates and your body's not functioning. Wheat and even this 100% uh, um, uh, what you call whole grain cereals. They do exactly the same thing that wheat does. Lentils to a lesser extent. So if you're gonna take lentils, then you'd rather just sprout it. But sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and sweeteners are highly addictive. That includes stuff like candera. Because you have a Coke light or a sugar-free Coke, that sweetness triggers a thing in your brain to says, I want to eat something sweet. Now, the biggest problem is whenever we have an inherent problem, we don't acknowledge it. Addiction is real. Addiction to carbohydrates is real. And the addiction is mainly to processed carbohydrate food, okay? Because it quickly drives up the glucose and that whole process of causing your, your blood sugar to rise and getting hungry again. And guess what? even your mood changes. So you get hungry and angry, yeah? And there's a term called hangry, okay? So the physiology of carbohydrates is such that our body is not designed for high carbohydrate intake. It never was. But in order to keep the blood glucose at, at a maximum of four to five grams, which is about a teaspoon of sugar, um, the glucose gets stored about one third in the liver is glycogen and two thirds in the muscle is glycogen. So if you're having a ton of glucose and your body thinks this man is gonna run the comrades marathon like tomorrow, but then you never run the comrades marathon. And then it 
gets this load of glucose coming into it again. So what happens is it converts the glycogen to triglycerides, three glycogen triglycerides. And then it's still waiting for the comrades. Right? Nothing happens. So a couple of days later, the liver expands in size to fill more of this triglycerides. And then eventually that comrades is still not happening. So it turfs out all this like triglycerides to other parts of your fatty depots, like around your kidneys, inside your pancreas, in your heart muscle, in your brain, inside your muscles and the tongue. Now, many of you who are dentists would have seen that this guy's tongue looks big, but coincidentally, he's also big. Now make the link. He's got fatty infiltration of his tongue. And that's the same guy who will go, oh, no, no. His wife will go to the doctor and says, please give him something for the snoring. So they develop the sleep apnea. Now, there's a disruption in the homeostasis of electrolytes and water balance when there is a persistently high glucose level coming in. And that creates a disturbance in in how your body functions. Because remember, firstly, your body needs water in order for all these millions of, of, of chemical reactions to occur. And when there's a disruption in, in some of these micromolecules, like if, for instance, selenium and barium and stuff that you don't even think about, then your body doesn't function as optimally. But the big stuff like sodium, potassium, chloride are easier to notice. You'll get thirsty, you'll get a dry throat, you'll be passing more urine, and it's easier to sip. But remember over a period of time that if you keep passing out some of the stuff, it's gonna cause a problem. But the worst thing is that there's a disruption in the immunity because high glucose levels affects the efficacy of the white cells. It plugs onto the white cells and the white cell goes paralyzed. It reduces the production of antibody complexes. And then it disrupts the gut biome. The gut biome is the primary point of immunological contact. So, and, and remember the gut biome starts from the lips, the inside of the mouth. There are a myriad of different kinds of biomes that are present just in your mouth. And then you throw mouthwash into the echilomorph. And what we found is that there's a higher incidence of people with peptic ulcer disease in those who use mouthwash regularly. So that gut biome that's going from your mouth into your stomach is actually protective, all right? So my daughter tells me with fair confidence that uh, uh, mouthwash is a very good for athlete's foot. So there you have something that you can do for this. Coming back to the talk then, there's increased development of inflammation in the body. And that inflammation is presenting with a whole host of problems like asthma. Have, I mean, some of you older guys like Reggie and them, have you noticed that there are more people complaining of asthma now than they ever were before? And it's not because we're just getting brighter at diagnosing it. It's happening more frequently, including things like psoriasis and dementia. Dementia is occurring as early as 50. So, there's got to be something that's gone wrong. Now, we spoke about high glucose levels. We're going to speak about high insulin levels. This persistently high glucose entering the blood is, is, is causing a persistently elevated insulin level. And that makes you feel slow and tired. And the, the obesity which ensues also in, uh, worsens the immunity because the fat deposits in your body, it's just not a lump of tissue. It's a very interactive organ. It makes in excess of 12 different hormones, half of which are good and half of which are bad, depending on what you're feeding it. So if you're feeding it food that is generating triglycerides, then it's going to produce all the wrong stuff. But if you feed it ghee or butter or coconut oil, it produces all the good stuff. And when this fat is located around the internal organ, like your heart and your liver and your kidneys, then the outcome seems to be more severe in terms of its impact on immunity. Um, and we spoke about sleep apnea. 
So in those who have hyperinsulinemia, there's a five times increase in the chance of ICU admission from pulmonary infection. And then insulin is, is like a, a loss leaf in very high quantities. She'll interact with everybody, estrogen, progesterone, FSH, LH, testosterone, cortisol, the whole lot. And that's why we're seeing more women who have polycystic ovarian disease, who have obesity that is related to the, to the, to the hormonal problems. And now we're also seeing some reports coming out about its relationship to thyroid disease. Then there's hemodynamic effects, the salt and water retention. For a long time, I couldn't understand why my diabetics have such fat feet. And you know, you run a kidney test on them and it's fine. But what happens is that those of you who remember some of your physiology, the nephron has got a glomerulus and then the descending, um, the proximal tubule and the, and the distal tubule. There are four insulin controlled receptors and they both, I mean, they all control water and salt retention. So the more they are and the more receptors they are, it's gonna retain more of the water and salt. And that's what happens. And the next thing that happens is they develop hypertension and heart disease. So what about seed oil? We spoke about this, okay? And cholesterol, cholesterol is a fat. It is consumed. It is also manufactured by the liver. It is carried in the blood by lipoproteins. And the lipoproteins are made by the liver. They are chylomicrons, DLDL, LDL, and they come back by HDL. They aren't bad and good. It's just what they do. But because the blood is water soluble, these fat molecules have to be carried in these in these submarines kind of thing. Cholesterol is a core molecule in almost all of the, the, the steroid hormone, estrogen, progesterone, vitamin D, testosterone, including your bile salts. It composes about one fifth of all the molecules in the cell wall and the mitochondrial wall. And it is the core lining in the neural channels in the brain. And cholesterol per se does not cause heart disease. So what is heart disease? It's when an artery in your heart is blocked, like that one and you get ECG changes like that. And then this is what we call the widow maker, yeah? And that's what we don't want. So what it is, is that there's a persistent increase in, in, in deposition inside the lining of, of the arterial wall. But this is, if you sit down and you look at it, these are the molecules and because they're tiny, these are actually abnormal LDL molecules, and they can very easily penetrate either in between the endothelial cells or through the endothelial cells. And then they get, they get caught up underneath the lining in a whole web uh, that's specially designed to hold this thing. And because they oxidize, they like stand out like that. Who see me, see me. And then what happens is that the monocytes come down and they can easily penetrate there. And they says, you are not my friend. And it engulfs it. And it keeps engulfing more and more until it forms this thing called a foam cell. And then you get migration of the, of the muscle cells into that to form this plaque. So this plaque is not a tokoloshi who's painting cholesterol onto the inside lining. It's an inflammatory reaction brought on by triglyceride rich LDL. So this small dense LDL I mean, we've just gone through all of that. It, it, it is one of the most destructive things that man has seen. <clears throat> so I think I'd, I'd, I'd be a bit short in my presentation if I didn't speak about COVID. Let's understand one thing is COVID is affecting mainly the elderly in terms of its devastation. And we're seeing worst outcomes in patients with metabolic disease, blood pressure, type two diabetes, stroke, kidney disease. And it is worse when your inflammatory markers are high. It is worse in smokers. It makes the blood clot easier. 
COVID itself makes inflammation worse. And it inhibits your T cells. So just like the bloody HIV, it stops your T cells from fighting. Nitric oxide is the hormone released from the endothelial to dilate your arteries. And it stops that. And then it also has the ability to worsen the cytokine storm. Now, the cytokine storm is what is causing all the pulmonary problems. That initially what happens is that the, the COVID infects the cell. And then as a result of, of the reaction, the, the antibody reaction, the cytokine storm just produces and clogs up the lungs. So what can you do? Stop eating junk. I've just explained to you the role of all of these different uh, food things in, in causing the problem. Stop eating wheat. Wheat is probably the worst thing we can ever put in. And sugars, all of it, including cereals. Stop fruit, stop sweetened things. And guys, if you ever wanted a time, then here it is, stop smoking. Smoking increases your risk of inflammatory disease, increases your risk of catching COVID, increases the clottiness in your blood, and it makes the arteries get narrow. Come guys, not rocket science. Eat real food. Meat, fish, chicken, eggs, veggies that grow above the ground. Simple. Let's go back to what we used to eat properly. Okay? Eat good fats like butter and ghee, and it's not going to, I just showed you the, 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 the pathology of, of, of uh, coronary disease. Tallow, tallow is, 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 is animal fat. Olive oil, avocado oil, tree nuts, not peanuts, tree nuts. And then improve on your gut and mouth immunity, right? So you can't underemphasize the, 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 the role of brushing and flossing regularly twice a day, right? And then using a good probiotic. So try and use the natural stuff. There's kefir, there's unfiltered apple cider vinegar, there's kombucha, there's a whole host of them, all right? You just gotta look out and you get sunlight. I mean, Jesus, these days we sit in our offices and we bake in artificial light. We haven't even seen the sunlight out there. So the ideal time, up till about 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, between four and five in the evening, ideal, because that is when the likelihood of, of getting sunburn is the least. But remember, it's not only for the vitamin D, because some of the sunlight, it impacts onto the, the skin and it produces nitric oxide. Good guy, okay? Do light exercises, especially your shoulder girdles, your pelvic girdles, do some squats while you're standing and looking at the sun. Yeah, flap your arms up and down. It's no joke, but while you do it, then Anita will even show you how to breathe. Breathe through your nose because that's the other place you release nitric oxide from. Okay? And she will tell you how to do all of this thing. Meditate, guys. This is the one thing you can do to calm your mind. Listen to music. Stop watching the news. COVID is going to go to 50,000. So what? So what? Spend time with the family. Do a bit of gardening. And just relax. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But it'll happen better if we are better prepared for this. Start with one thing and keep adding. And you'll find that eventually your ability to deal with this thing will just amplify. I think that was my last slide. Yes. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, there's like stillness. Are we going to entertain questions? Ankaj, do you want to quickly take the three questions that are here? Yeah. So, thank you very much. It was a very informative presentation. Uh, the first question comes from Dr. Chetty. Hi, Doc. What's your views on statins? Have you been what, told sir? by... What views is on your statins? view on statins? Statins. Yes. 
Okay. If you've been told by the specialist that you need to be on chronic statins, what do we do? Can chronic use of statins predispose you to becoming diabetic later in life? Great talk. Okay, so let me, let me address the question and then we'll go on to the next one. Is that fine? Yes, that's fine. Okay, so firstly, statin. So statins are, are agents that we consume orally and they impede the liver's manufacture of cholesterol. So I just want to cast your attention back to that slide that showed how the endothelial dysfunction happens and you get an atheroma, yeah? So those LDL, LDL are molecules that carry cholesterol away from the liver to the body tissue. Cholesterol is essential for almost all cellular functions, including your mitochondria. Now, if you suppress the manufacture of cholesterol, then what happens is that the body tissue is going to substitute it with something else. And it's going to substitute it with whatever else you're putting into your mouth. And if it's margarine you're putting into your mouth, then that is polyunsaturates. And what happens is it disrupts. So it's like taking your house and instead of a brick, you're putting an elastic, you're putting an elastic block. And just one elastic block won't affect the structure once. But if every third block of yours is becoming elastic, your house is going to look like that. So statins only block cholesterol. It's got some anti-inflammatory properties, which we use, yes. So if you have a coronary right now, I'll give you an aspirin and I'll give you a statin because it's got anti-inflammatory properties. But if you stop taking the junk, you won't get inflammation, you won't need a statin, okay? Um, does it cause diabetes? Yes. It has been shown conclusively that and in fact, there's currently a, 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 joint, action, a joint action suit in, in the States where about 240 women who had been started on cholesterol for no good reason have developed type 2 diabetes. So we know that this is happening. In fact, guess what? People who are taking statins have a higher incidence of dementia. Men have a higher erect incidence of uh, testis testicular dysfunction and erectile dysfunction. We have people who live for a shorter period of time in terms of quality of life. So taking a statin for 20 years will increase your life by three days. Three days. But in those last five years of your life, you'll start forgetting who your children are, you'll start forgetting who you are, and you'll become a derelict. And if that's what you want, I don't have a problem. There is no scientific evidence to prove conclusively that putting a person onto a statin has a beneficial effect in terms of the outcomes for metabolic problems. Metabolic problems are brought on primarily by high carbohydrate food, inflammatory food. So statins can be a solution. And in fact, the the, the big brother, which we call the PC, PCSK9 inhibitors, is even worse. Hammond, yes. sorry. Yes. In, the, in the interest of time, we're going to just um, browse through two or three more questions because we're coming to our end time and we still have uh, Dr. Bika that's going to close off with a really nice experience. So um, maybe two more questions, Pankaj? Yes, thank you very much. Um, what do we replace cereals with? So members want to know what do they replace cereals with? That comes from Dr. Pestana. Okay. So <laughs> cereals are junk. So as I mentioned to you, choose meat, fish, chicken, eggs, vegetables. I mean, there's a whole variety there. Yeah? You don't have to have a cereal. And if it is a cereal type of thing that you're looking for, then ask your wife to, to or do it yourself. Um, 
boil up a cauliflower and mash it. Or take some coconut flour and add hot water to it and you'll have a porridge. And you can add your full cream milk to that or you can add coconut cream to that. So, and if you want crunchiness, then throw in some coconut flakes. Thank you very much. We'll take one more question. Is flora approved by the Heart and Stroke Foundation healthier than butter and ghee? <laughs> okay, so, you know, almost everything, if you go into the Heart and Stroke Foundation, you will find that most of the foods that they promote cause an elevation in your blood glucose. Now I showed you that elevating your blood glucose cause a rise in your insulin and it brings on the whole cascade of metabolic diseases. And uh, I was talking, talking to Reggie the other day. He says, so we keep driving over the pothole and then we keep finding newer ways to fix up the puncture, which is what, med what, is what med modern medicine is doing. Just fix up the pothole or drive around the pothole. So why, if you looked at all of these guys, they need that stamp of the Heart and Stroke Foundation to legitimize what they are doing. I want you to, to do the research and see how much of inflammation all of those products on their list actually causes. Except for the sardines and the tin fish, there's nothing beneficial in there. Flora shouldn't even be fed to your dogs. I'm saying this again. Flora shouldn't be fed to your dogs. In fact, dog chunks is the worst thing we're feeding these animals. My animal did, you know, developed liver problems until I stopped all of that junk and started making food ourselves. And now she's picked up two kilos. So, and that, that's, an, that's a physiological experiment in the making. We're doing this Folks, we're doing this to ourselves, our families. I'm saying the time when we get drawn by our nose rings about what's beneficial for us needs to stop. Every bit of information you're getting about COVID, you're gonna Google the thing and look it up. Why haven't we done that about nutrition? I'm saying, just go and look at it. The information is there. The big farmers, the big food manufacturers, all of these guys don't want you to know that. The time has come when you need to find it out for yourself. We'll, thank you very much. We'll take one question from Facebook from Dr. Andre DeVette. Does raw honey affect your insulin like sugar? So honey is, is a bit of a strange guy because it's got, it's got sugar. It's got pure unadulterated sugar. So it's gonna cause a spike in your insulin. But it's got a whole lot of other beneficial things. It's got some things that improves your immunity and it has got certain uh, uh, nutrients in there which does help the body. So if you're gonna take a half a teaspoon of honey with a robust tea that Reggie does every now and again, and you, you throw in a bit of lemon in there, then it's fine. But if you're going to take about, you know, three or four teaspoons of honey, I think you're playing with very high levels of sugar. So in a person who's, who's, who's got a thin belt, a BMI of less than 25, the occasional honey is not harmful. But in a person like myself, I mean, my BMI is 26 now. It was 28 at the beginning of 2018. And I think if I take a bit of honey, my sugar just goes sky high. So... Remember also, we are hotwired in our brain. There's a satiety center. And that satiety center is not controlled by sugar. It's controlled by fat. We don't have something that tells us to stop eating sugar. And in fact, the more we eat it, the more addicted we get to it, the more we want it. So if you eat something sweet like honey, you're going to want to eat more sweet things. Thank you, Hamid. Thank you okay. for uh, quite uh, uh, for many for many. It's going to be um, looking at health from a different prism, actually, a new paradigm. And perhaps these COVID times are challenging us to look at everything 
you know, in a new light. So, you know, being conventional for many of us, it's really looking at things with a different view and, and really, like you're saying, see if it works for you. Re, you know, experiment on yourself and see what happens. So thank you very much. Um, I know that for some of our viewers, it's, it's, very, it's a very different take, um, you know, but globally, the world seems to be moving towards functional medicine and a more holistic approach to food and all of that. So um, why should we lag behind? Thank you. I agree. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Dr. Vishal Bika to give us a beautiful closure. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can everybody hear me? Uh, once again, good evening and uh, thank you, Dr. Vallab, for that wonderful presentation. I think you bring light to the expression of you are what you eat. So uh, once again, thank, thank you for that. Um, my name is Vishal Bika and I am part of the Wellbeing Work Stream and um, I'm, I'm very happy to be on such a work stream where we can bring such uh, uh, enlightenment to the dental profession at large. So ladies and gentlemen, one of the objectives of um, the well-being and mentorship work stream is that we are here to help empower your well-being and your state of mind. Because at the end of the day, we must remember is that, that your happiness matters, that your mental health matters, and that your existent, existence matters. I know over the past few weeks, it has been rough and it has been tough for a lot of people. It has maybe affected us mentally, um, maybe emotionally, as well as socially. And therefore, I feel that this platform is a very important platform. We don't realize that, but um, these are small aspects of our life, which uh, makes a big difference. And I always love inter incorporating the aspects of mindfulness into dentistry because it is much needed in our profession. Our profession is a very stressful profession and we need it. So today I'm going to share with you a very simple feature of mindfulness and that is the feature of gratitude. Yes, gratitude. And gratitude in essence is being thankful for what we have in life, what we have around us. So I'm going to just narrate a very short story for you guys. So once there was a man sitting in a wheelchair, he's looking out of the window and he sees another man walking to work. Uh, and, and he mentally says to himself that, damn, if it wasn't for that accident years ago, I would have had a functional pair of legs and I could, could walk properly. Then we move on to that gentleman who's walking to work. He has a mental idea, a mental thought that comes across his mind when he sees somebody drive past, ride past in a bicycle. And he says, oh, I wish I had a bicycle. I would have got to work much faster. Now, the man on the bicycle, he is riding to work or to the shops. And he sees, he sees a lady driving a car. And he says, oh, I wish I had a car. I would have get to the shops faster. I could be able to put my things into the car. And now the lady in the car has a thought, oh, I wish I had a bigger car. So ladies and gentlemen, all of these people, they have two things in common. Number one is that yes, they do have a bit of challenges in their life or what they think are challenges. And number two is that they could be a bit more grateful for what they have. So that's why we come to the importance of, of gratitude in life. We need to express gratitude in every aspect of our life. Of our life. If once we start expressing gratitude, we learn to value things. We learn to value and appreciate people around us. We learn to appreciate the objects around us. We learn to appreciate more what we have. So we need to change our attitude from one of uh, of more from expectation to one of gratitude. We will then learn to have, once we express gratitude, we will feel that we have a lot of abundance. Abundance will automatically come to us. 
So ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to take a lot of time. I'm going to do a short gratitude exercise with you. Now, for those who want to close their eyes, they can close their eyes. For those who want to keep their eyes open, can keep their eyes open. If I may just add that gratitude, expressing gratitude has a very positive ripple effect. It helps us then become more unconditional. It will allow us to share unconditional love towards others. It will give us more comfort. It will give us more understanding. And we appreciate the people around us. So ladies and gentlemen, here's the exercise. So I want you to think of, let's say three people that are the closest to you. Maybe it's uh, your mother, your father, it can be your wife, it can be a sibling. Now just as I'm thinking, you create that picture in your mind and you just run the story in your mind, create the notions in your mind. So I'm thinking of three people, I'm thinking of my mom, I'm thinking of my dad, I'm thinking of um, a sibling. Now, just express gratitude mentally to those three individuals. Okay, hope you're doing that in your mind. Now, take it one step further. You're thinking of these three people. Now, go one step further by, by expressing why do you feel grateful to these people? For example, it can be if it's your mom, you can say that your mom, you're grateful to your mom for giving you the nicest hugs. Um, if it's your dad, you can be grateful to your dad for making the best brides. If it's a sibling or if it's a wife, you can be grateful to them for giving you the best smile when you get home after a long day. Now, just in your mind, express gratitude to all these people. The next thing what I want you to do is go and express gratitude for three things that's in your home. Make it like basic things. Let's say it can be the meal that you had in the morning. It can be maybe something like grateful for having running water. Anything simple, maybe even grateful for having a bed and having a good pillow to sleep on. So hope you're running all these, 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 these areas of gratitude in your mind. Now then, focus on three more sophisticated or materialistic things that you're grateful for. Maybe it can be a car, or it can be the internet through which you are using the Zoom meeting, or it can be maybe a vacuum cleaner for allowing you to clean your home. So you can choose whatever you want to be grateful for. Now, I want you to go to your workplace, the dental environment, and I find three things in the dental environment where you can be grateful for. For example, it can be your dental assistant, it can be your receptionist. Then maybe go on to the next aspect. Say, I'm grateful for having so many patients in my room. And even if it was just one patient for the day, say, I'm grateful for that patient for coming to me. Then maybe you can say, I'm grateful for my hands that give me the ability to work. So ladies and gentlemen, that's, I'm not gonna go on any further. If we look at all these areas, there is so much to be grateful for. We can go on for an hour or two being grateful for the smallest things in our life. So let us try and get that habit into our life. Let the thing, the first thing we do when we wake up, be one of gratitude. Let's say as soon as we wake up, I'm grateful for three things, choose three things. And maybe every day of the week, it can be something different. So I want you to start uh, trying this, this, uh, this exercise, this gratitude exercise. And um, as, as the well-being and mentorship work stream, we're gonna try and incorporate a lot more techniques that can just help you in general, small aspects that can help make a big difference in your life during this trying time. And also once this trying time is over, it will maybe help you grow and become a better person. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna end off with one expression and maybe you can just keep that in mind. And it goes like this, when gratitude grows, 
happiness flows. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. I thank you for listening. And um, uh, Dr. Kusal, I hand over back to you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Very inspiring wisdom from a very young dentist. Thank you very much. If we can bear that in our hearts and minds moving forward, where gratitude goes, happiness grows. That's very powerful. And you know, for us as a collective to practice that, um, definitely when we go into the opposite of that complaining, the happiness and the goodness gets blocked. You know, this has been experienced by us. So um, thank you to Dr. Vallabh once again. Thank you to all the viewers. Um, we will continue. Yes, some of these presentations are contentious, but let's have healthy arguments. Perhaps one day we can uh, invite Dr. Vallabh again, someone suggested, um, and, and have a nice healthy debate with someone from um, traditional conventional medicine. Someone has asked for that. Let's do that. Let's bring it on. And um, uh, if any of our panelists want to just say a line, if they would like to, or we can close. Um, Dr. Alistair uh, McCaffrey has joined us all the way from the UK. Thank you. He's from the DP. Um, would you like to share a line, perhaps? In closing. Yes. Um, thanks, Anita. I'm pleased to, to be with you tonight. I think this is one of the very few days where uh, I can honestly say it's hotter in the UK than it ever is in South Africa. <laughs> and we, 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 we have a heat wave today. My goodness, we have 28 degrees today. So that's cheered everybody up. Um, but the problem is we've got nowhere to go and nobody can go to, well, well we can go out and about, but not very far. But um, I, I think we have a little bit more freedom than you guys have at the moment with level four restrictions. But uh, it's, it's nice to listen and it's nice to be part of the problem. Uh, and I know there's a couple of questions coming up, but some of the things that you guys are, are struggling with are the same as your colleagues in every other part of the, the world at the moment. So you're not alone and that there's a huge amount of consistency amongst the anxieties and the uncertainties that the dental profession are facing uh, with the pandemic and then with the future of dentistry as well. Uh, Thank you, Alistair. Um, does uh, Mr. Govan, would you like to say something in closing? Yes, uh, Dr. Vala, but just to remind members that Dr. Vala has kindly answered most of the questions that was posed by members. And I think he wished to raise one last point, if he's permitted to do so. Short and concise, thanks. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, I have this, this is program for my diabetics. And contained in this program is, is, a, is, is a light meditation, jyoti meditation. So I've, I've sent, I'll send it again to, to, to Reggie on WhatsApp. And for those of you who are interested, it's universal, it's non-denominational, um, with, no, with no connotations to any religious sect or group. Um, and my patients find it extremely beneficial. So I'll pass it on to Reggie. And then those of you who want it, you just contact Reggie and he'll, he'll pass it on to you. It's about 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, Prof, would you like to say something in closing? Uh, well, not in closing, but I thought it might be um, beneficial for Dr. McKilvey to just um, mention the kind of support that DP has for its membership in terms of wellness. So um, one of the benefits of MPS membership, and it's just for, for all of our members, is access to counselling services. Uh, and I've previously mentioned this. Um, we, we, we really didn't associate the, the welfare of our members with the outcomes of their cases, but um, in 2010, we had two dentists who were in the middle of regulatory proceedings, and there was a risk that the, the outcome would be quite serious for them. And 
um, we were aware there was a lot of stress. We were aware there were there were, there were problems at home. But what we didn't know was that both members had suicidal ideology, and um, the the end point was was that the the hearings never took place because both dentists took their lives in very tragic circumstances, and then we realised that. Um, there, there was more to life than going through regulatory proceedings. And we also realised that, uh, that some of the stuff that we do with our members is incredibly stressful for them. Um, we see it, we, we don't necessarily recognise how stressful it is because it's part of our job. But um, when there's a threat, you might lose your career uh, and the financial aspects that come with it. I think that um, as human beings, we're very vulnerable. So that what we decided to do was we decided to put together a counselling service where members who were in the middle of stressful cases could access a free counselling service. And as we moved into the pandemic, we realised that um, this was going to be as stressful as for some as regulatory proceedings. We also knew that there were many practitioners out there who lacked financial resilience in their businesses. And so we've decided that our counselling services are open to any of our members at the moment. The way to access the counselling services through our website. Now, if you go to the Dental Protection website, uh, you'll see that there's a little not drop down box that is country specific. So you go to the South Africa version of our website, then you log in as a member, you need to have a username and a password, just like we do for SADA membership. And once you're in there, you get access to a telephone number, which takes you to directly through to our counselling service. Our counselling service is, is contracted out to a company called ICAS, and they're part of the AXI group. The counsellor that you will speak to is local to you in South Africa. One of the reasons for picking ICAS is we could be sure that the counsellor you will be able to speak to will be no more than 30 miles from where you are located. So we've got a good covering of counsellors in all of the countries that we operate. Now, it may only take one conversation to sort the problem, but it may take more than that. And our counselling service at the moment is unlimited. We reckon that most counselling services will involve no more than six appointments, but if there is the case to carry on with that, then the counsellor will make representations to us uh, as the funder of this service, and we will respond as positively as we can in the circumstances. So, thank you, thank Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. That is such a generous offering. That's lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, if anyone wants to have a quick one-liner, you can unmute yourself. Otherwise, we can close the meeting because we've run um, a few minutes over nine o'clock. All good? Lovely. So then we will meet again next week. We have a little surprise for you too next week, Wednesday. And we're open to uh, input with regards to topics that you would like to have us covered also open to guests that you'd like to bring to this panel, um, your suggestions, we're growing together, be strong, be safe, be at peace. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists, Prof, Dr. Reddy, Vishal, Krubashni, Hamid, Pankaj. Thank you. And thank you, Norma, for all the background work. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank for you. All thank you. Good night. And thank stay you. safe. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. See you. Um, Good night. I'm going to. Norma, you're going to end the meeting now, Norma? I am ending Thank the you. meeting now. Good night. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody.